Hi, my name is Sergio Sandoval. I am professor at the University of Guadalajara in Mexico. I am a sociologist and I am so glad to participate in this conference. What is the purpose of this presentation? This presentation is an exercise in the sociology of sociology. I'm trying to analyze a case of appropriation of ideas from European sociology by American sociology, specifically the sociology of Pierre Bourdieu. I argue that the analysis of the genesis and trajectory of one of the most influential articles produced by contemporary American sociology can reveal much about the way in which this discipline has evolved in the last four decades, as well as its current trends. In 1983, the American Sociological Review published an article under the title The Iron Cage Revisited, Institutional Isomorphism and Collective Rationality in Organizational Fields, signed by sociologists Paul DiMaggio and Walter Powell. In this article, the authors intend to offer a novel theoretical model that explains why, in modern societies, the various organizations with different purposes, that is, public and private, for profit or non-profit, etc., always end up resembling each other. There, they introduced the notion of organizational field, which consists of those organizations that, in the aggregate, constitute a recognized area of institutional life, key suppliers, resource and product consumers, regulatory agencies, and other organizations that produce similar services or products. In a short time, the article reached a notorious diffusion. Greenwood and Mayer, a pair of management scholars, comment that only a small number of documents have an incredible high citations count and lasting influence, particularly in the North American academic and scientific world, reaching even to have to reprints and recently a Russian translation. Indeed, the trend in citation is sustained even if we resume the article's statistics today, from August 2008, when Greenwood and Mayer reviewed the Web of Science, by the second half of 2020, the total number of citations increased fivefold, from 417 in 2008, it had 13,487 only in its main collection. Okay. But that the article after almost four decades is increasingly cited is not what should attract attention, but the fact that it is a text that has not had a significant impact on the field of sociology itself. Indeed, although the article was the product of the American specialty of the sociology of organizations, it has had a great influence on other practical or applied disciplines particularly those of management and business, among many others, on which it concentrates more than 65% of the citations. Although Greenwood and Mayer do not simply highlight this high number of citations and its lasting influence, but reconstruct the history of its elaboration and publication, even their analysis does not stop moving within the limits and interests of the field of management. His article was published in the Journal of Management Inquiry. Um, the American sociologist Thomas Medvedev has affirmed in 2013, referring exclusively to the Iron Cage Revisited, that in the United States, the first true appropriation of the field concept as developed by Bourdieu corresponds essentially to the emergence of DiMaggio and Powell's theory of organizational fields. 
This will lead to attribute the key to the success of the article to that appropriation. However, Medvedev overlooks an important problem. In that article, Burdue is not quoted at all, so that, in principle, his claim would seem untenable. It is not clear how DiMaggio and Powell appropriated the field concept as Bourdieu developed it, without citing him. Various scholars have argued that his article was inspired by Pierre Bourdieu's sociology, supported, among other things, by the evident fact that in 1983 the authors, DiMaggio in particular, already knew it and has used it explicitly and that they did not cite Bourdieu due to an editorial need to simplify the text. However, this does not explain why <laughs> they avoided citing Bourdieu in that particular text, nor does explain exactly how Bourdieu's field theory was appropriated, nor to what exactly can its enormous diffusion be attributed. To answer these enigmas, it is necessary to study them separately, but with a losing sight of the unity of the problem. I argue that the answer to each of these questions are closely related to each other even though we have to answer them separately. The year following its publication, 1984, 80% of the citations out of the total of 10 articles were in the management and business categories together, 40% in sociology. By 1993, then, Years later, although the number of articles had increased fivefold, the proportion of citations was 79.8% in management and business, 30.4% in sociology, and so on. While it is true that the article is increasingly cited in global terms, it is also true that it is less and less so both in the management and business categories and sociology, dispersing more and more in very heterogeneous categories. Likewise, it is observed that the research areas in which the article has had the greatest impact are organizations, studies, and organizational analysis. This shows that the article, The Iron Cage Revisited, has been relevant mainly in categories outside the field of general sociology, first import, imported from the sociology of organizations by the management and business disciplines, in turn, this have favored its more widespread diffusion beyond themselves, mainly through organizational studies and, to a lesser extent, organizational analysis. To understand how the relationships between all the disciplines are structured and to explain the trajectory of the iron cage revisited in them, one can use the model of the scientific field and scientific innovation made by Timmans, Waters, and Heilbronn, inspired by Pierre Bourdieu's field theory, that they use to analyze another object the subdiscipline of so-called mixed methods. The model is structured by two axes, a vertical axis on the degree of scientific capital, understood as scientific and intellectual prestige of the agents and institutions and, therefore, of their productions in a horizontal axis 
on the degree of autonomy or heteronomy of the positions that test agents occupy. This structure makes it, makes it possible to describe two opposite trends, left and right halves of the graph. According to the type of scientific innovation that is viable, the higher degree of autonomy corresponds to the fundamental innovation, theories, knowledge, while the lower degree of autonomy, heteronomy, corresponds to innovation related to process, that is, methods and applications. Next, the model distinguishes quadrants that correspond to four types of strategies put into play by the agents based on the expected benefits and that depend on the possible combinations in the degree of scientific capital and the degree of autonomy. Defensive strategy, high capital, high autonomy. Offensive strategy, low capital, high autonomy. Dependent strategy, high capital, high autonomy. And opportunist strategy, low capital, high autonomy, or low autonomy. Okay. Um, Unlike the more autonomous pole left, where the struggles between orthodoxy and heterodoxy are fought for property, for properly scientific legitimacy by virtue of the so-called essential tension, in the more heteronomous pole, right, although the main battle is also for scientific capital, it is observed that at the dominant side, those with more scientific capital tend to have access to the field of power. Agents who hold the most economic and cultural capital, such as by holding positions in policy advisory committees or company boards. The dominated groups at the side of the field will cater more to practitioners or professionals outside of the field of science. The analysis of bibliometric trends shows that the article has exerted a growing influence outside of the sociological field and increasingly heterogeneous fields. It began with management and business by virtue of the dependency relationship that they have historically sustained with sociology. Afterwards, its influence has gradually diversified into a great heterogeneity of disciplines and subdisciplines, while it is less and less in the strictly sociological field. According to the model of the scientific field and scientific innovation, this characteristic places the article and, by extension, the sociology of organizations in a position of low autonomy. Regarding the axis of scientific capital, the very evolution of the space of influence of the article shows that, although at first it could obey a strategy that is most dependent, typical of dominant positions, over time it has worked within a mostly opportunist strategy, typical of dominated positions. Since it increasingly influences practitioners or professionals outside the field of sociology and even beyond management and business. The characteristic of agents as well as institutions and journals that occupy heteronomous positions, always according to the model, is to concentrate on innovations and processes, that is, on research methods and techniques and, consequently, on their possible practical applications. This means that they must operate in appropriation of fundamental innovations, theoretical and epistemological ideas, either in a dependent or opportunist way, according to their volume of scientific capital to this process, must also be added the fact that that fundamental ideas often come from different national contexts and scientific traditions, giving rise to various forms of appropriations. Thus, according to previous analysis, the iron cage revisited is 
precisely a paradigmatic case of this type of appropriation. When interpreting the citation statistics of the iron cage revisited with this model, we can observe that its trajectory is precisely adjusted to that of an intellectual production typical of a specialty with low autonomy and low scientific capital, from which it is concluded that the sociology of organizations of which the article is a product has these characteristics. As King has well expressed, organizational sociology has moved toward the periphery of the discipline. One can identify in the production of the Iron Cage Revisited the implementation of a strategy that, although at the beginning could have been dependent, ended up being completely opportunist, having used Pierre Bourdieu's sociology as a basis without citing him, a fact that, although widely ignored, has been established by various authors. Indeed, bibliographic research allows us to affirm that not having cited Bourdieu in the article was not due to an eventuality, but to a strategy aimed precisely at influencing at the same time the sociological field and disciplines and professions foreign to sociology, an opportunist strategy that was structurally determined, not necessarily necessarily conscious by a particular moment in the history of the American sociological field, in which sociology departments previously driven by the state's social policies began to be subordinate to schools and departments more in line with neoliberal wins, such as business schools. However, to explain exactly how Bourdieu's field theory was appropriated, I suggest that, instead of focusing on the notion of field itself, we focus on the fundamental epistemological principles observed by Bourdieu, that is, in the structural or relational reasoning model that is typical of the general theory of sociological knowledge. I am unable to present this full analysis now due to time constraints. However, I can outline it as follows. According to a chronological and critical analysis of the author's production, particularly of Di Maggio, rather than a mechanical or direct appropriation of the concept of field, what is carried out in this article is an appropriation albeit partial, of the general theory of sociological knowledge that Bourdieu subscribed to, and which he exposed in 1968 in his article Structuralism and Theory of Sociological Knowledge. The central idea of this general theory is that sociological knowledge inevitably requires the adoption of a relational mode of thought, the same that underlies the so-called structuralism. So, instead of citing Bourdieu, DiMaggio and Powell cited Giddens' notion of structuration, which was the key to overcoming the Weberian organizational perspective and putting things in structural terms. For example, Bourdieu explained in his 19. 68 article by interpreting in relational terms the Goffmanian idea of total institution that it is sufficient then to conceive of each institution or class of institutions constituting the system as so many isomorphic cases of a single group of transformations in order to be able to grasp the invariant characteristics which each of them is given by the logic of the total institution. This fundamental relational perspective is what explains its versatility and consequently its enormous diffusion. Thus, we can affirm that the great diffusion of the iron cage revisited mainly in disciplines and professions outside sociology, is explained both 
by the strategy that determined its elaboration and by its capacity of generalization, which is due to its appropriation of the fundamentals of the general sociology of Pierre Bourdieu. By the way, all this coincides with a tendency in American sociology to put aside Bourdieu's field theory and to privilege the concept of habitus and capital, which produces studies that, while being valuable, are unfortunately partial. For example, this uh, paper uh, you can see in, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the screen. Uh, it is important to always remember that the concepts of habitus and capital acquire their full meaning only in the context of field theory. Okay? Finally, I would like to emphasize that, ironically, if my analyses are correct, to solve the enigmas posed by the iron cage revisited, it has been necessary to analyze it from the very field theory of Pierre Bourdieu. Thanks for your attention.